Allô tout le monde, bonsoir. Maintenant, je vais faire une petite transition et parler en anglais, si ça dérange personne. Donc, uh, hi everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging where we are. So, in Jajage, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. And I'd like for everyone to just take a moment to reflect on how you came to be here, how you exist in this space, um, what you take from it and what you contribute to it and to hold um, those thoughts with you throughout this event and hopefully um, after you leave. So my name is Nene Miriam Konate. I am one of the co-founders of CCMTL and my co-founder Kisha Chung is actually here um, right now. And I am super excited to be joined by Faria Roshin, who is an amazing author and an overall um, inspiration. And actually, two years ago, on this very day, Kisha and I launched our platform here at Never Apart. And one of the people who inspired me to do that was Faria, because I was a listener of your podcast, Two Brown Girls. And so much of what you and Ziba shared on that platform encouraged me to share my, my own voice. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today. I'm getting emotional. <laughs> We said that we might cry, but we didn't know it would happen so soon. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, yes, I wanted to begin by saying thank you so much for being here today. Um, and, by, yeah, and by asking you what it's like. I mean, I said that I was inspired by you to start my own platform, to do my own work, but I obviously didn't know you personally at all when I felt inspired uh, by you and was compelled to do what I did because of your presence on social media. And I'm wondering what it's like to be um, a brown Muslim femme on the internet in pop culture and to represent so much for people in ways that can be positive and at the same time loaded, um, and how you're impacted by those people's expectations. Um, thank you for your words. Um, it's super challenging to exist in a world where a lot of people have expectations about who you are and what you represent and, and what they need out of you. I think often my humanity is stripped from me and I become a avatar. Um, and there's been really a lot of benefits to that because I have a platform and people seem to engage with what I have to say, which is really wonderful. I fought really hard for this, but at the same time, um, simultaneously, it's so uh, exhausting to continue, um, especially because the things that I'm talking about aren't easy to talk about. You know, when I, I lived in Montreal, a lot of people don't know that, but I lived in Montreal for four years and I left last year. And um, when I lived here, I got into a lot of fights with people. And um, it was just like this everyday occurrence where, um, or not everyday, but a very regular occurrence where um, I was constantly being told by not just white people, but everybody that I was too uh, angry. And um, that was like, I mean, and I was young and I had verve and I was like, whatever, I'm going to do whatever. And there, there was this youth that I think is really compelling when you're young because you're like, I believe in what I have to say. Mm -hmm. But the amount of friends that I lost um, because people thought I was isolating them because I was talking about white supremacy. I think that that's, it's really hard to negotiate that when now we live in this age where like people find wokeness to be cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then I also have to acknowledge all of my four mothers that came before me, you know, like I didn't come up with anything. If anything, I was just like being like, okay, I'm Muslim and I'm queer and those are two things that nobody really talks about. So let me find a space to talk about that. But like, 
I learned a lot from like black radicality, you know, from the 60s and the 70s and like the Black Panther Party and like all of these um, re revolutionaries that were being jailed, you know, that were like f facing real life violence. And so for me, that's like what I saw as, as the way that we need to go. And, you know, you brought up two brown girls and I started that in 2012 with my friend Ziba and the reason that we started it was because the TV show Girls just came out and we were like, why is this all about white women? And we were two writers in New York and it didn't make any sense to us. We were like, this does not represent anything about where we come from. And, and like what New York media or like what culture owes to people of color, you know? And, and so um, we made this uh, podcast when there were no podcasts. Nobody knew what a podcast was. There, there were those days. And um, <laughs> like we never thought anyone would listen to it. You know, we, like, we were like, okay, well, we're just gonna, initially we were like, okay, let's do this web series, but we're really lazy, so we didn't actually do it. And so we were like, next step, uh, podcast. Um, and pos you know, the podcast just seemed a lot easier to, to manage. <laughs> and um, uh, so we started that, and we were both working as film critics at the time, um, and being completely locked out of rooms, not being let into spaces, because w film criticism is always from the angle of a very cis, hetero white man. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's sort of the genesis of 2BG. And it blew up in a way that we, we did not expect. And I think it really spoke to the absence of, of what people were, you know, a lot of people were feeling. A lot of folks were like, you know, they felt invisibilized, but they didn't know how to claim that space for themselves. And especially in like an, in a new way, new way in a new age, you know, like in the age of the internet, like people didn't know how to like claim that space. Um, but with that came a lot of downfall, a lot of, a lot of, again, expectation, a lot of people, um, sending us weird emails and, and being like, you know, you're not doing this, this is what you're doing wrong. And like, sometimes they were so helpful. Um, you know, like when, when you're getting a comment that's like, you're being ableist, it's like, that's really fair. And I think that that's very important to, to say. Mm -hmm. But when there's like other just like whiny messages, you're like, really? Like, I'm, let me live. Um, and there was a lot of that, like, let me live. Like, we're doing this for free. <laughs> like, f you know, it's really hard for ourselves. Like, as we were simultaneously trying to have careers, mm -hmm. it was a really hard process for us. So I still don't know how I feel about it, like, how I feel about all of this. It's, like, great to a certain degree because I get to meet wonderful people. I get to talk about things that I think are really vital to talk about. But with that comes a very strange exchange where, like, people don't always see that I'm a human being that's very flawed and I'm always going to make mistakes, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting that you brought up that we're in this moment where, you know, wokeness is used kind of as this social currency, but s so long as it's palatable. But if your wokeness is something that is too radical, all of a sudden it's as though you've gone too far. Um, and then the tension of being able to express that in more intimate spaces when you are considered almost invisible and then being thrust into hyper visibility and then having all of your politics like looked at through a microscope. Um, and like this idea that all of a sudden when people are hyper visible, they're supposed to be perfect. Um, and I think that that kind of goes into what we were talking about the ideas of like politics of wokeness and like call out culture where we want to call out things that are not perfect we want to call out things that are not easily like consumed um and then that we don't know where to place people that are important to us but we feel have failed us um and i'm wondering yeah how people interact with your work because it's so public when 
they would have wanted you to do something a certain way and almost feel entitled to not just asking you to do it that way, but telling you to do it that way. Um, and how it sits with you when people react in this manner. Um, yeah, there's a lot to that. Um, I think to, s to answer your question in a roundabout way, I think for me, it's been, I'm hyper aware of the fact that I'm only palatable when I talk about my trauma. And, um, and like that's, that goes, like that's, there's a, the good and the bad with that because I'm, as a brown person existing in a white world, I have relative privilege. At the same time, like my parents came out of genocide where three million people were murdered in 1971 and nobody talks about it. And so like that is, a, it's an extraordinary weight to carry, you know, and if anybody has read anything that I've written, I write a lot about my mom who has schizophrenia, is bipolar, she's borderline, um, and my mom has tried to kill me when I was 12 and my sister was 19. And negotiating writing about that was so hard because I asked my dad basically for permission and he was just like, just don't make your mom look bad. And it's something that I think about all the time because um, like, you know, agents come to you and they're like, write about your mom, like write about your pain, get a, get a like six figure book deal about, you know, like all this stuff and they don't understand like to unearth all of that, like what it means not just for yourself and for your soul, but what it means to your family. Mm -hmm. and like what they have to do so like yes there's a part of me that's just like wow nobody knows about my trauma and like where I come from and like where like what my mom has to deal with and why she is who she is because I think there is so much erasure in in the world because a lot of a lot of writing about race does become about like blackness or whiteness it doesn't there isn't a lot that exists within the two in the in-between space and so there is a part of me that wants to sort of like talk about that but anybody who writes about trauma knows that it's it's not it's a double-edged sword because you're constantly having to then like who's paying for your therapy I got what like I got four hundred dollars for that piece that I wrote about my mom for broadly in 2015 that's not going to cover my therapy you know, so it is this like, and at the time I was like, that's so much money. <laughs> and I was like stoked. But it's so much more glamorous than people think it is. Like, sorry, it's not so much, it's so much not less. as glamorous as people think it is. Um, like, you know, with that comes an, an incredible amount of shit to uncover afterwards, to, to put it, to not put it lightly. Like, you're just like, left in this space where it's you and you're, you're facing an abyss mm -hmm. and, and who holds you in that space, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, bless you. Um, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think it's difficult because there's also so many different ways to be held. Like you mentioned the Broadly piece and being paid only 400 for it and like, yeah, if you are to continue going to therapy, you have to pay for that. So there are ways to be held financially, there are ways to be held emotionally, mm -hmm. psychologically, all of those things. And then I guess it's navigating all of those landscapes and figuring out what feels okay to take and how that lands on you um, and what doesn't feel as, as okay. And I'm just wondering, yeah, in the practice of writing about trauma or exploring your own traumas, knowing on the one hand that you are doing it for yourself and your own healing journey, but then once again, existing in this broader landscape where in a white world, particularly when brown femmes speak about trauma, it almost immediately mobilizes this white savior complex of where like all brown women need to be saved, et cetera. And so it's easier to place a story about a brown femme's uh, like trauma than like a brown femme's healing. Um, 
brown femme joy, like all of these things, and yet all of these aspects are part of lived realities. Nobody is just their traumas or just their pains or just their joys, mm -hmm. etc. So I'm wondering how you hold space for your complexity as a person in your writing practice and how that perhaps interacts like with the broader context that you're existing in. Um, earlier this year, I did a call out on Twitter um, that was just simple. I was like, I don't want to write about my drama anymore. If anybody wants to hire me to write, you know, cool pop culture pieces, I'll take it. Um, because it was getting so repetitive where, you know, five publications were writing, asking me to write about the same thing even though I'd ever also already written about it. And I needed money, you know, and so in a lot of cases I did the work for no money, basically. Um, and then you hear about people making $3 a word for 1,500 word pieces and you're like, wait, what? This exists? So that was my way of asking for abundance because mm -hmm. last year I lost four really close friends and in the process of that happening, I realized that I could give whatever I thought was enough to other people and they could never feel like they need to give anything back. Mm -hmm. and that I can't give care as a way to get it back. I, it's, it's not always transactional like that. And so it really forced me to look inside of myself and be like, how do I take care of myself? Um, and I've been writing about self-care for a really long time, um, both individually and, and, and I was writing a piece with a friend, uh, a, a, a column with a friend for a while. Um, and at a certain point, I, yeah, I just, I realized that even the people that I thought were closest to me could really hurt me. And, and that was shocking. Like I still have not mourned those friends. It's taken me a really long time to, to fully grasp that people will betray you. And people will betray you in the most heinous ways. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it actually was like happening alongside me getting more well known. I lost four major friendships. And that was just like a kind of like a, a, a thing that I was circling around in my head but not really allowing myself to believe. Mm -hmm. I just thought this is coincidental, like it can't actually be the reason. But there's a huge elephant in the room, like femmes don't support other femmes, mm -hmm. pure and simple. Like mm -hmm. we don't like seeing other women, other femmes succeed. And I've, I've experienced that firsthand. And in, in, like, in ways that were just, again, like shocking, like people essentially making lies up and, and, and talking about me behind my back. And I was just like, wow. And I had this friend this year who was like one of my closest friends in Montreal, actually. And um, I reached out to her and I was just like, hey, I feel like there's this you know, void between us, what's going on? And, and she said, um, I think your selfies are an example of your narcissism. And I was just like, I started taking selfies in 2016 because I hated myself so much. And you know that. Like, it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just like, I thought I was ugly and disgusting and I've had body dysmorphia since I was like nine and you're really going to tell me this? And to this day, I don't know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. Where do you place that pain? Like, where do you place the attack and the violence that people that you once loved and made space for in your heart, the moment that you choose to be like, I see myself, finally, I see myself, and they look at you and they say, that's not good enough. Like, why don't you also see me? Why aren't you also carrying me? Mm -hmm. Or like, it's like, 
Or simultaneously, it's like you see yourself and I find that threatening. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, it's just like we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really not helpful in these conversations where we're moving forward and we're talking about feminism. In the broadest way, we're talking about feminism. And it's just like within that, we need to really comprehend the fact that like we don't make space for feminism, like in a, in a lot of ways, like obviously patriarchy, misogyny, like, but like women can learn those things and have learned those things and perpetuate those things. Mm -hmm. Just as much as like a lot of us perpetuate white supremacy or transphobia or fat phobia, like all of those things, you need to unlearn them. And if you're not engaging with the fact that you have these things and built into your body, you're not going to, to love the people in your life when they're succeeding and thriving and you're not gonna hold them. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, in a good way, made me realize how I perpetuate those things because I, I had to unlearn so much, you know, and jealousy is such a huge thing. Like when you feel it, you're like, it's, it's indescribable and you're ashamed of it. And instead of engaging with it in a holistic way, you attack people with it. So I've been trying to hold myself accountable and be like, okay, like, this really hurt me. How do I not do this to other people? Mm -hmm. I was literally just having a conversation with my mom <laughs> today in the car about this um, and about how holding yourself accountable um, and trying to, like, just going to get real cheesy, mention the four agreements, um, <laughs> but, like, <laughs> to, hey... <laughs> Like, being impeccable with your word, um, to me, is one of the four agreements that always stuck out to me the most. But what, also, What are the four agreements for people who don't know? So definitely the one that I remember is being impeccable with your word. Um, and the second one that was most important to me was don't t take things personally. The other ones are along similar lines, and if someone else knows them, please bring them up. Um, but those two, I find are quite important in situations like those because if you are accountable, if you are trying to bring forth love in your relationships and for one reason or another that love isn't being reciprocated, it becomes a little bit easier to accept what the situation is. It doesn't mean that the situation becomes easy or isn't traumatizing or any of those things, but knowing that you've put forth your best in intentions, that you love this person wholeheartedly, and that maybe this person is not able to hold this love that you have for them in this shape, or that they cannot hold the love that you have for yourself now that has taken a different shape than when um, they met you, it's easier to heal from that when you know that you've been impeccable with this person versus if you feel that you've been reactionary with them, etc., which is so much easier said than done. But I think that what you're saying about, you know, anti-femme behavior is so real because we're all socialized to feel more comfortable and less threatened around the femme that hates themselves. <laughs> It's so it's much more relatable. easier. It's more relatable. It's easy to have that right. friend that you're rooting for and to be like, hey, like things are gonna get better. Hey, you think you're ugly, but I think you're pretty. Hey, 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 you know? But when you have a friend who's like, yeah, I think I look good today. People yeah, like, how dare you? How dare you? Like, who told you that you could... You fucking suck. Exactly. You know, like... Only I can tell you you yeah, look good yeah, today. Yeah. You should hate yourself. I own you. you know? Break all your mirrors, who are you? Um, and I think that we're, we're, liter we're just not used to seeing that. I, I, on just like a very basic level, I've seen that in social media. Like I've seen it when I'm like sad and crusty and I'm like depressed. People engage so much more with those posts than they do with me being like, I feel happy today. People are like, well, okay, fucking log off then. Like nobody wants to hear that. You're you know, like, and it's, <laughs> It's just like, it's so sad to me. It's really sad that that, that feeling f is, is more threatening than it is um, excite exciting or um, inspiring, mm -hmm. you know? Because I think to me, when I see someone else's joy, I'm inspired by that. Mm -hmm. 
But I think this kind of ties back to the idea of how like radical thought, radical actions, or radical love are things that are very threatening. Yeah. Because we've never really experienced them here on a societal scale. So even when we see them on an individual scale, a lot of people's immediate reaction is to recoil. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm wondering, yeah, how you, regardless of this, hold space for that self-love and that self-acceptance and what positive ripples that might have created in your life. Although, yes, some people have decided to retreat, um, but what energies have entered your life as you've, you know, decided to start taking selfies, decided to announce your joy, decided to take more space with your positive self-thoughts? Um, it's been a personal revolution more than anything. Um, you know, we look at people and and media and we think that they're superhuman. And then the only time we respond to their pain is when they're crashing. Um, And I don't want to be that. I don't want to be there. Um, So again, like I started a healing practice a couple of years ago. And a lot of that was by talking about self-care within black and brown communities because they don't really exist. You know, we're not really taught to feel good about ourselves because in just to be real, we have to fight white supremacy. We're fighting a lot of things. So it's not always possible to be like, I love myself, you know, like it's, it's just not something that you're taught. So, you know, my parents were immigrants and, and they moved to, to Canada um, and I was born here and then we moved back to Bangladesh when I was four and um, my dad was a teacher and um, a radical, he was, a, he was a Marxist and so there was like uh, and not assassination, but they tried to kill him. And so my dad had to, we had to leave. We had to flee. And, and I think that's sort of a real life thing for a lot of immigrants who want to go back to the countries that they come from, but they're not always allowed to go back, you know, for many different reasons. And a lot of that has to do with the violence that they experience there. So it's this constant push and pull Um, and navigation of living in a country that doesn't really want you, so the West, the countries that don't really want you, and then simultaneously not being able to go back to the country you come from, and being in this constant liminal state. Um, And yeah, and then we moved to Australia, and that's where I was raised. Um, And my mom was deeply, deeply depressed and I never had access to nice things when I was younger um, because a lot of the attention was on my mother. So we, you know, my dad didn't have the resources to look after us mm-hmm. completely. He, he definitely tried and I love him for that, but um, he couldn't always give us what we needed, me and my sister. Um, so we were deeply damaged and then I essentially fled. When I was 19, I I moved to New York because I got into school and I lied to my parents that I was going to go to this school and I dropped out and I never told them. And um, it's like, it was deeply shameful for me for years and years and years. And like, a lot of people would ask me like, why don't you just tell your parents? And I'd be like, (laughs) really? Like, yeah, so they can kill me? Like that, it's not that, you know, like it just, that's not my life. Um, So I had to lie to them and like, that's a reality for a lot of black and brown folks. A lot of, I can talk about say South Asian folks because I think South Asians are deeply rooted in like this cultural lineage where like parents do really put a lot of pressure to perform, but uh, in a lot of cases they're immigrants, you know, and when they came here, many of them didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. So the only way to, to be something and they like they worked odd jobs and 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 jobs that nobody else wanted to do, you know, 
to, to ensure that their kids had some kind of support so they could send them to school. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I knew that. And I was still, I was a brat, and I was just like, I want to be a writer. Mm -hmm. So I dropped out of school, and I never told them. I was in law school, and um, started this journey. And so at no point was like self-care a thing for me. And then, yeah, and then I became very self-destructive, and then slowly, slowly into my 20s, I hit a point where I just knew it was not sustainable for me to keep running from myself, running from my pain, running from the history of where I come from, and that I needed to face the music. And so, um, and, that, and that basically happened, like I, uh, had a suicide attempt in 2015 in spring and that just like rippled my whole life, ruptured everything and, and I knew that the only way to survive was for me to choose myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been in, on that journey for three years and it's an everyday battle. You know, today I woke up and I felt like shit and you kind of just have to work through it, you know? You gotta just remind yourself that you deserve to exist. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you for existing because if you didn't, I literally wouldn't be here right now. Um, as someone who has like struggled with anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation almost my whole life, I, I, I empathize with you and I'm not gonna say that I know what your life is like because I obviously don't. Um, but it is really difficult to choose yourself in a world that urges you to choose literally everything, everyone else. Um, but it is so inspiring for people to see people that are close or far from us choose themselves. And it does create positive ripples that others are not necessarily aware of. Um, and I think sometimes it's hard when we envision the work of choosing ourselves like for the rest of our lives, but sometimes just seeing someone choose themselves in a specific moment can reveal to someone else that that's even possible mm -hmm. in ways that we weren't aware of. But it is absolutely difficult work. Um, and hearing you speak now just made me think of um, the doc that you suggested <laughs> I watch, which I did and I cried all the way through, the work, um, would recommend this to everyone. <laughs> um, essentially, it's um, these men who go through this um, four-day therapy program at Folsom Prison, which is like a high security um, prison in the States, and some of the men who participate are inmates, some of them um, are visiting just for the duration of the program. And it's amazing to see them like delving into the most difficult and the most tender parts of themselves, um, and coming out of those parts and bringing up something new. Um, and I wonder if that's part of the difficulty of choosing oneself. Because even if the rewards are great, the work is very difficult. Um, and it brings up things that we sometimes don't even remember were there. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, I'm wondering if you could speak about, yes, the, re the rewards of, of choosing yourself and how that's affected the way that you interact with other people, perhaps. Everybody should watch the work. It's a documentary, it's on Google Play, you can watch it on YouTube. It's a, you know, then I just gave an explanation of what, it, what it's about, but it's just so profound to see folks that aren't allowed or given the space uh, regularly, that them being straight, cis men, you know, they're rarely given the space to be vulnerable or emotional, and you know, in this documentary, they're encouraged to cry, and they're encouraged to talk about what aches inside of them. And it was just so 
beautiful. I, I think everyone should watch it. I think it should be taught in schools. Um, uh, say your question again. I just needed to talk about the work. Um, it's okay. We can talk about the work all night. Um, <laughs> um, essentially, like the rewards of going to that really scary place inside when you choose yourself, mm -hmm. um, and it means like working through difficult things, but what are the positive rewards um, of choosing yourself? And I also have like a side, a small side question. Like you said that, you know, before your early 20s, you weren't really th um, thinking about self-care, but would you, would you say that you're moving to New York and choosing to like accept your truth as a writer was in fact an act of self-care? Was like you choosing yourself but then was it difficult to continue choosing yourself afterwards? Sorry if my question makes no sense. Um. <laughs> okay, I'll, start, I'll answer the first question first. Um, the rewards are just being honest. And, and, and I think that's been one of the greatest gifts of being online and, and people responding to the things that I say because I think I do think that a lot of people need it. I talk about things that, and I get these messages all the time sent to me where people are like, I needed this today. Like I was suicidal or I was depressed today and I needed to read this message, so thank you. And that is always just so special and I, it means so much to me that I could help anybody. Um, but all I'm doing is just being honest to myself and to my process. Um, but it that has been incredibly rewarding. Um, but also moving to New York, yeah, it's again, it's a battle. Like, you know, I'm I'm a Muslim immigrant living in America. It's like never going to be entirely easy. Um, but you gotta do it. I just think of it, it's the work. It's mm -hmm. just the constant work. You just gotta do it. You gotta keep going. No matter how hard it is, you know, for yourself and for your work and for the work you wanna see in this world, you just gotta keep going. And sometimes it feels impossible. The work feels like it's so much and how do you bear this? But I do, feel like the, the people around me, the communities that I've been accepted in or allowed into, the, the people that I don't even know sending me messages, the people that respond to anything that I ever have to say, I, I, I mean, the, that's the reason I keep going too. Mm -hmm. Because I've, I've, I've been embraced in a way that is so tender and uplifting for me. And I don't think I could do it if I didn't have that. I just want to bring up a quote from the work <laughs> where, where they say <laughs> that when you go deep down into the well, so the well that is yourself, um, and you get right next to the wound, that's where the medicine is. Um, and I don't care if I'm cheesy. People who know me already know that about me. Um, <laughs> But I feel like that's also like representative of what it's like to choose yourself, to go through like all this difficulty, but to find that within yourself there was this powerful thing that helps you keep moving and that this thing also connects you to others. Um, and I'm wondering how that work um, extends into radical love and extends into compassion and how that helps have a more nuanced view of people. Um, I'm particularly thinking of the article that you wrote about MIA after having the interview with her um, and how it was received. But then at the same time, what ideas that brought up? Because when we chatted about it, we talked about how situations like this often bring up like just the reactions of call-out culture where, okay, because someone did this, this person is officially just banished to this third space where we'll never see them again, we'll never have to think about them again, and that's the only way that we'll heal, as opposed to 
accepting that, okay, this is this person that we idolize and that we love, and this person is human and this person is capable of failing, and what does it mean that we are so disappointed by this pe person being able to hold these ideas and also hold everything else that they symbolize? And what does it mean to continue to love that person while still holding them accountable? Um, and I think we both found this particularly interesting because these ideas of just calling people out and banishing them are so intimately related with like ideas of incarceration and the prison industrial complex because it's essentially the same action of just casting people away um, and kind of forgetting about them like they don't exist anymore. But they do continue to exist and they do continue to face violence and potentially perpetuate violence. And we're just like, they're right here <laughs> and we're like this. Um, so I'm wondering how, yeah, the work of choosing yourself has perhaps helped you extend compassion to other people, um, but then also how that compassion is being um, interpreted and, or whatever you want to say about compassion. Yeah, what actually. a big question. <laughs> Um, so for those of you who don't know, I wrote an essay about MIA last month because I interviewed her on stage at the MoMA in April. And when I was asked to interview her, um, I had a moment where I was like, I can't do this um, because I hadn't really been listening to her music for a couple of years because she had said something really, which I found very problematic. I think a lot of people found problematic, but somebody asked her about Black Lives Matter and she was like, well, what about Syrian Lives Matter and Muslim Lives Matter? And I was just like, this is so dumb. Like, you just can't equate those two things. Or like, you know, it's not a competition. All things can matter, but we're just focusing on black life right now. Um, or like black life mattering means that every life matters, you know? Um, and, and then like I had a light bulb moment where I was just like, wait, what if I just asked her this question? And what if I asked her like, let's talk about this, this comment that you made um, and the effect that it's had on people, the very real life effect that it's had on people. And this is somebody that, you know, the first thing I said to her on stage was like, people stopped me on the street and used to think you were, I was you. And that had nothing to do with the fact that we look like one another, but there we're both brown girls and I had blonde hair for a while. And, um, and I thought it was funny, but it's, all, it's also, it goes back to the fact that like, there are no famous brown people. <laughs> like there was like, MIA and literally nobody else. And then now we have like Mindy Kaling, but you know, that's, that's another thing. You know, we have Aziz and that's also another thing. So like, it's problematic. Um, and so, you know, like being a brown person is, is really hard because like, you are literally locked in between blackness and whiteness and you're constantly like, what am I? Like, wait, what am I? And so that's why you see a lot of brown folks either choose whiteness or choose blackness. It's problematic, but nobody talks about it. And vilifying people is not helpful. I mean, it's just not for me, because we need to talk about the genesis of these things too. And so, yeah, I called her out in the nicest way I possibly could, and I wanted to start a conversation um, and she just didn't want that conversation. And it was really embarrassing. It was really hard. It went on for about 20 minutes, um, one answer. And afterwards, I felt really sad for her more than anything. Because I could see that she wasn't, like, she wasn't anti-black, but her comments were anti-black. You know, and but like in the media, what you say becomes your everything. So, you know, and if you're not taking the time to, to ch unlearn or to check in and be like, actually what I meant was X, Y, and Z, then you're not helping the conversation. And essentially she wasn't helping the conversation. She wasn't wanting to be like, I was wrong in 2016, 
Instead, she was defending herself. Because to her, it was so absurd that anyone would think that she's racist. And so I was like, what do you do with that? So I wrote an essay about it. And it was an essay about how to hold people you love accountable. Um, and it was one of the hardest things I've ever written in my life because I was saying, I was talking about something that nobody really wants to talk about, which is, you know, what do we do with people that have failed you? And this sort of not just stemmed from this conversation with her, this actually stemmed from me too. When I was just like, I don't know what, to what end are we doing this? Because this is great. The fact that like men in power are being taken down 100%, I want this. But like, what's next? Like, how do we move forward? And nobody was having that conversation. I, 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 at least I didn't have access to that. And it just, it was a lot for me. And my mom is my abuser and she's in my life. So I was bringing up all of this stuff with her where I was just like, wait, but like my own abusers in my life and I've, I'm trying to heal with her, that's my journey. And you know, I, I kept, you know, especially being adjacent to media, I kept being uh, allowed or like asked into conversations where people were like, let's bring men down. And I was just like, wait, but like, okay, yes, but what's next? You know, let's, let's talk about if we don't believe in prisons, if we don't, if you know, if the prison industrial complex, if this is fucked, like how do we actually actively make safe spaces for people to heal? And that's what I'm more interested in. Because I think that's the work. You can't tell somebody, don't do something bad, and then when they do it, punish them. And then also be like, prisons suck. Okay, like, let's, uh, let's talk about that. Prisons do really suck. And, and you know, they're, they've, you know, especially in America where, like, I mean, I don't, I don't even really need to go into it because I think we hopefully all know, but it's so dangerous. It's such a racist system. And we do need to break down what's happening here. Um, and the backlash to the article, I mean, it was mainly positive, but there was a little bit of backlash. And it was really hard for me to engage with the backlash because I found that even though there were comments, because it was the backlash was essentially like people being like, well, okay, like maybe talking about call it culture, cancel culture is important, but fuck MIA. And <laughs> this meme, I was like, well, we're back to square one then. <laughs> um, and. You can, you can agree that this person maybe doesn't deserve mercy. We can all agree that with that. You know, to a large degree, I'm like, I don't really know if she does, because if she doesn't want to change, then does she really deserve my compassion? But unfortunately, like, healing doesn't work like that. Like, compassion doesn't work like that. If you want to be compassionate, you have to be compassionate towards people that don't really want your compassion. Um, and so I, yeah, I mean, that happened a month ago, or less than a month ago, and I'm still kind of figuring it out. I'm still trying to parse through the feelings of the contradiction of, of, of folks, you know, thinking, yeah, prisons suck, and, and, and the, the conversation ends there. To me, that's so performative. It's deeply performative. If you don't want to do the work, don't say, don't cri criticize it. Mm -hmm. And I think it also ties into um, something you were saying um, when we chatted on the phone about seeing so many things globally but through an American lens um, of like, oh, so we just have like, Prisons are so normal um, in North America. Um, we're used to the prison industrial complex at this scale. And so we're used to like everything in our daily lives flowing into that structure. Um, so then we look at someone like MIA, 
who didn't grow up here has a different language, um, experiences these things differently, and we're just like, okay, well, this is just what we do with you. Right. Um, but something that you mentioned is that her language is, is just different right. to speak um, on these ideas, and this happens often in situations where people are, are dismissed, and this is not at all like trying to play devil's advocate or, or justify what she said, um, but I think nonverbal language plays also a big role in compassion, in realizing what can't be expressed perhaps in words or what's lost in words, um, and how some, something, about, something about love and compassion extends beyond those words, and I'm wondering how you feel um, about that. Love and compassion extends beyond words. Um, you mean my love and compassion or her love and compassion? I, I'm just saying, I think love and compassion in, 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 general. in general, particularly when it comes to people who um, may have w like wounded you, um, how like making space mm -hmm. for for those people for their context, yeah, and for their context, and it doesn't even necessarily mean forgiving them, yeah, um, but how sometimes that act of trying to reach for those people or to understand them happens outside of verbal language? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I brought up in the article was that, you know, this is somebody who's 42 years old. She doesn't have the vernacular of being a woke person. You know, she's she didn't grow up in the age of the internet. That doesn't, again, excuse any of the things that she has said, but um, we're also talking about somebody who literally comes from genocide and was forced to leave her country and her dad was a terrorist and or deemed a terrorist rather he was um a revolutionary and um she was like forced into like a deeply white skinhead community where she was like the only brown person that's deeply traumatic and so that's where she comes from. And I understand, again, like people being like, well, fuck her. I don't care. Her context doesn't matter. I do understand that. I really do. But I don't think it's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, because, again, it goes back to, you know, what we were talking about. Then what do we do with everybody who fails us? We can't just put them in the side on the corner and, and abandon them that just doesn't work as a community. We don't, where we're hopefully all fighting to get, it, you need to be compassionate in order to get there. And unfortunately that labor does fall on the backs of people that can't always do it, you know? Black folks, brown folks don't always want that labor. And that's real, you know, like if, um, if a black femme is just like, this is way too much for me, I, I understand, you know, like that, that makes total sense to me. You do not have to show compassion, but I think we just have to have a larger conversation about like what to do with cancel culture because we're all problematic to a certain degree. We've all said problematic things, you know, Monroe Bergdorf, who's this amazing trans woman activist, she recently tweeted this and, and she was just like, listen, like I have all also had to unlearn so many things in my own life. And we're not just born out of the womb being like super woke, you know, like it's, it's a process that you have to go through. And of course you need to be willing to get there and, and go through it. But to isolate people that are doing things wrong or who've done things wrong, and yes, maybe don't want to engage with the fact that they've done things wrong. It, it's annoying as hell, but we, we have to find a system that works where we are uplifting one another. Because I think right now, in an age of Trump, we can't afford to not band together. Mm -hmm. um, to bring down white supremacy, we need to, to come together. Um, and that's why like, when there, when there is resistance to sort of compassion, I'm like, 
that's what white supremacy wants. White supremacy wants us to not work together because we're way stronger when we work together. Yeah. This makes me think a little bit of um, something you mentioned in an article, I think where you were talking about spirituality and like religion um, and how sometimes there's probably misquoting you right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you can correct me, but sometimes kind of believing in God is kind of like believing in the universe and your place in it and learning to love and accept yourself and extend that love to other people. Um, and throughout time, people who have affected change in so many different ways have chosen love, have chosen to accept that love can exist between them and others and that they can create something um, with it. And maybe, I'm so sorry that these are not your exact <laughs> words at all, um, but I think maybe something like that is maybe what's, what's needed now. Yeah. Um. Yeah, like we we're fighting gets you know it fighting brings you to your knees, you know the the exhaustion that I feel sometimes and the the navigating the you know when Nia Wilson was murdered by a white supremacist a month and a half ago, you know like constantly experiencing and you know, reliving that trauma, even not as a black person, and being like, how is this happening in America? You know, those things are really hard to process. But, and and I do understand that it's my privilege to be like, let's heal, but I, it, take, it took me a lot to get here. Mm -hmm. And I'm here, finally. And it's because, yeah, negativity and, 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 being hateful or being angry does work to a certain degree, but it doesn't have, it, it has an expiration date. Mm -hmm. The things that actually work and are sustainable, and if we want sustainability with ending white supremacy, then we have to find a way to love each other. I'm so corny, but it's true. I really, really, really believe that it's the only way. Yeah, I believe it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but also, like, calling people out is great. You know, like, yeah. you know, I think that, like, I don't want to <laughs> be, I don't want to sit here and be like, just be nice. That is not what I'm saying. I think, like, especially in Montreal, let me just be real for a second. Especially in Montreal, like Montreal is hella white, okay? Like the amount of times that I had, I was like, I had to leave parties and crying because people were like uh, telling me that I was angry and I was too angry or I hate white people or, you know, <laughs> whatever. We have to find a way to talk about racism in Montreal. And that means community engagement. And I will be compassionate as much as I possibly can, but I need to be met halfway. Mm -hmm. And it, it really, really sucks that my memories of Montreal are marred with a lot of bullshit from people that made me feel small for speaking up. And I could go into stories, but I won't. Um, you know, I, I do think that if you know, you're know you white in this room, please take what I'm saying with love and work towards a better future. Because you know, we, need to, we need to be real now. There's, there's really no more time left. We, we you know, if, if, you're, if you don't have people of color friends or you know, you've told your people of color friends dumb shit, like just, just like unlearn white supremacy. We all have to do it. We all have to unlearn something, but we all have to want to try and change. And I just, I just wish that there was more, um, more acceptance of the things that I said in the last couple of years and, 
it's great that like we're having this event here, but it's hard for me, me to believe that it's happening to a certain degree because Montreal was very cool to me mm -hmm. for many years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think one thing that can be said about Montreal is that it's one of those places where there's this ev every, like all permeating assumption that the work has already been done and that is often the most harmful thing because if everyone assumes that the work has already been done, no one is willing to do the work. And I think that because of the way that even like social racial structures are set up in this city, there's a lot of like, if you're gonna go to a queer event, like there's gonna be a bunch of like queer white people there and you might be one of the only queer brown people or queer black people, etc. And you're gonna be around all these people who think that they're on the same page as you um, and will be completely unaware of the things that they are um, perpetuating. perpetuating. And I think, as you said earlier, you know, choosing love is, choo is choosing honesty. So I think, as you're saying, you're urging everyone to be honest with themselves. Um, and, and we're all ugly to a certain exactly. degree. You know, it's okay to be like, I'm wrong or this is wrong, but just acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. Just acknowledge it, because then that's somewhere that we can move forward mm -hmm. that from that point. But if, if people are in denial about the things, and I think Canada just is really in denial about its racism. And, you know, like, I would get into conversations with folks and they'd be like, I mean, you know, Canada's not the same as America. We didn't have slavery. And I'm like, yes, we did. <laughs> Read a history book. Like, and it's just, you are not different. It's, it's really, you're not. Yeah. And... You know, there's all this like cute, like Canadiana things, like oh, we're we always say sorry and whatever. We're so nice. Um, it's not true. It's a myth. It's a myth, and and we're sitting on this myth, and we're we're that's great. And when you compare yourself to your ugly cousin downstairs, you're like, wow, we're great. You know, we'd never elect someone like Trump. Let's wait and see. You know, because. Nobody thought Trump would win. Yeah, look at Ontario. I don't know. Um, <laughs> let's see what happens at the next federal elections. I don't know. We're so different, right? Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it, it is really important to, to acknowledge that this is the place where we live. I definitely echo a lot of the sentiments that you've shared um, about Montreal, and I think that it's absolutely true that if we're to heal through the situations that we're living, we need love and we need compassion, but we need to not idealize those concepts and recognize exactly. how much work they actually entail right. um, and how much like, you know, internal work and societal work um, they require. Right. And I thank you for making us acknowledge those things. Uh -huh.